So welcome everyone to this webinar, celebrating the transformation of transplant services at Addenbrooke Hospital. My name is Katie Britton and I'm the Head of Hospital Engagement at Addenbrooke Charitable Trust. We're just going to wait for a few moments for everyone to join us so we can see all the attendees coming along. So thank you everyone. So we are absolutely delighted to welcome you today to hear from the members of the Cambridge Transplant Unit who will be talking to us about the developments in the department and what charitable donations have enabled them to achieve. So whilst we're just waiting for everyone, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping points for today's webinar. Firstly, we will be recording this webinar to share with you all after the event. There will be an opportunity to ask the panel questions later on, so please feel free to submit any questions you have throughout the webinar using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And thank you to those of you who have already pre-submitted questions. We will endeavour to answer all questions that we have time allowing, but anything we aren't able to ask, we will seek answers for and follow up with you after the event. So Addenbrooke Charitable Trust has been working closely with the transplant department for a number of years. And thanks to your support, we've achieved a great number of things together. As many of you will know from personal experience, the transplant unit is a fantastic department who has a great range of skills and expertise and they change people's lives every day. We're here to talk to you about the changes that your support has enabled or our four guest speakers. So we have Professor Chris Watson with us, who's the Professor of Transplantation. We've got Neil Russell, the Clinical Lead for Transplant Surgery, Stephen Bond, the Lead Specialist Nurse for Transplant, and Kate Pickley, who's the Senior Sister for Transplant High Dependency Unit. So we're going to start the webinar hearing from Neil, who's going to tell us about transplant services provided at Addenbrooke's and give us an insight into the department. So if I can hand over to you, please, Neil. Thank you very much, Katie, and good morning, everybody. Um, and, and thank you very much for taking the time to sign in and to hear about what we do at Addenbrooke's. Um, we are very privileged to be able to work at Addenbrooke's um, and <clears throat> the unique setting that we have here. And uh, it is unique, and it is unique in the UK as the only centre that performs all abdominal transplantations. So that's including liver transplants, kidney transplants, pancreas transplants, and int intestinal transplants um, in adults. And obviously recently we've had Patworth move on site onto the, which is now the largest biomedical campus in Europe, uh, meaning that all abdominal um, and cardiothoracic organs are transplanted here in Cambridge. Um, we are a very active unit um, and we're certainly one of the, the busiest units in the country if you combine all the, the transplants together. And last year, we nearly achieved about 350 organs being transplanted in Addenbrooke's. Um, and that kind of the majority of those were the kidney and liver transplants. So we did over 200 kidney transplants last year, over 100 liver transplants. Um, we did uh, over 20 kidney and pancreas transplants and 10 what we would term multivisceral transplants. So that's transplants including uh, an intestinal graft. We cover a large area and it's a, that area is different depending on the transplants we do. So there are more units in the country performing kidney transplants. So our area is smaller, so that's the East Anglia. We cover a bigger area for liver transplants, um, extending down to patients from Southampton. For the pancreas transplants, it's East Anglia, extending up to and including Nottingham and Derby. Uh, and for the intestinal transplants, we actually being one of only two centres in the UK that perform it, cover the entire UK. And we are the only centre in the UK that do intestinal and liver transplants. And actually, we're one of few in Europe, so therefore we do get patients from elsewhere in Europe and have transplanted patients from Denmark, Italy, Bulgaria and places like that. So um, it means that we need a very diverse and specialist team. We have 13 transplant consultants working in the unit, a, a large number of uh, uh, transplant coordinators who help with each of the organs coordinating, um, managing the assessment of the patients, then uh, through their transition through the ward and then helping manage their outpatient activity. Obviously we have the absolute necessity of a, a fantastic and specialist nursing team on the wards. And we have two dedicated transplant wards, one which is a high dependency unit with five high dependency beds, where um, everything just apart from a, a step down of it, people being ventilated in intensive care can be done on our transplant unit. And we have 28 general beds on our general transplant unit with the specialist nurses looking after them there. Um, Different to a lot of surgical specialties, the care of the patients most definitely doesn't stop 
when we finish the transplant and they'd be discharged from hospital and transplant patients are followed up in clinic with us for the life of their transplant essentially and that means that our outpatient activity is very busy and increasing year on year as we transplant more patients and just to give you a brief idea we see about 200 clinic appointments for kidney transplant patients alone every single week in Addenbrooke's. Um, this is how busy we are now but um, and it's been increasing over time and, and actually Cambridge since the start and the evolution of transplant has been at the forefront of transplantation um, and that's going back over 50 years ago when Sir Roy Khan started the transplant program up in Addenbrooke's and we were the first people or he was the first person to do a liver transplant in Europe in 1968 and introduced cyclosporin which was one of the revolutionary immunosuppression drugs back in 1978 and that that innovation has continued through to this day um, and we're now one of the, the centres that are innovating technologies and machine perfusion, which Professor Watson's video will talk to you about in a second. Um, so we are a very tight knit group of surgeons and nurses and work as a, I think, a very kind of cohesive and, and dedicated team to try and help um, as many patients as we can uh, and, and have successful outcomes from their transplants. So I think if, if we move on now to the video, I think for, for Professor Watson. Yeah, thank you, Neil. So we're now going to show you a video um, with Professor Watson that demonstrates how the liver perfusion machine works that we have funded um, here at ACT. So depending on your internet connection, this video might be a little bit jumpy, but we will be sending the link around to everyone afterwards. Before I tell you about the machine, I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved in fundraising that's enabled us to use this machine and to perform transplants for 50 patients who otherwise probably wouldn't have had a transplant. This is our liver machine. It's made by a company in Oxford, but was originally conceived by an engineer and a surgeon here in Cambridge. The engineer was Greek, so he termed the machine the Metra, Metra being Greek for womb, so he envisaged the metra being a sort of womb to nurture the liver while it's been stored. The surgeon developed the circuit that I'm going to talk to you about. This is the liver I prepared earlier. We um, spend a bit of time doing surgery on it so we can isolate the vena cava that drains blood from the liver as well as the venous blood supply to the liver and the arterial supply to the liver. And we can connect that up to, to the machine. The liver sits in this box here. And essentially, blood drains out of the liver along this uh, tubing here, which we've colored pink for the illustration, into this pump. And this pump pumps blood up into this device here. This is an oxygenator. This is what puts uh, oxygen into the red cells, um, so they're able to carry oxygen back to the liver. So from the oxygenator, blood can go straight into the artery of the liver, but also up into this reservoir and drain into the portal vein, which is also another blood supply to the liver. The liver needs some nutrients while it's on the machine. Um, there's a little um, connector here, so we can put some glucose um, in to feed the liver while it's on the machine. And at the same time, we have some syringes over here that can provide some chemicals to help the liver. So for example, there's insulin in one of them, which helps the liver use the glucose. There's heparin in one of them, which helps the um, liver not, the blood not clot while it's in the circuit. Um, another one has got a, a drug that dilates all the blood vessels to make sure the liver is well perfused. And the fourth one contains some bile salts, which is what the liver needs to work on to produce bile. So on the screen, we can see how long it's being perfused for. Um, we can see um, what the oxygen level is in the, the blood, the carbon dioxide level, how acid the blood is, what the temperature it's running at, what the glucose level is. So it gives us all the information we need to be able to monitor the liver. We can keep the liver on this device for about 24 hours and the, the circuit itself is perfused with blood that we obtain from blood donors. So it takes four units of blood to run the machine um, and we can run it, as I say, for 24 hours until we need it. But typically it will be for about eight hours. Thank you very much. So I'm sure all of you will agree that that video gives a really good insight into um, how incredible this machine is. So 
I know many of you on this webinar have either fundraised towards the liver perfusion machine appeal that Adenbrooke's Charitable Trust ran, or have actually benefited from the machine in practice. So ACT worked in partnership to raise um, £250,000 for the liver perfusion machine consumables, which enabled vital perfusions and therefore transplants to take place. And the liver perfusion programme has been so successful that the NHS has now picked up the ongoing costs of running this. But this means that the liver perfusion machine continues to be used in surgery today and has become a core part of the NHS service. As we all know, 2020 has been a year of huge change and challenge for a lot of people. And this has, of course, had an impact on every area, including the hospital and including the transplant department. So I'm going to hand over to Neil and Stephen now, who are going to talk to you about transplantation during the coronavirus pandemic peak, the challenges the team faced and how they overcame them. So if I could hand over to Neil to start with, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Yes, um, it's undoubtedly been a very difficult time for everybody um, and for, for very different reasons. Um, it's obviously been exceptionally challenging uh, being and working in, in, in the NHS. Um, <coughs> transplantation is, is obviously an emergency specialty and we don't know when organs are going to become available and therefore it's, it's sometimes difficult to plan in situations like this. And there um, has been a lot of differences between the units around the country. Everybody's tried the hardest, but um, the ability to keep transplanting has varied amongst units, mainly depending on the amount of coronavirus that we're in those regions. I think we were relatively lucky in Cambridge, certainly in the first wave, that we didn't have um, the kind of same level of uh, infections that were seen in some of the other major cities in the country. And that enabled us to continue transplanting throughout. Um, and and from, a, from an operational point of view, um, it took uh, a lot of effort from everybody in the team um, and a lot of drive to maintain services to be able to do that. But it's not just about the operational side of things, it's, it's trying to decide what's right. And that's where it was very difficult because this, we were in completely unknown territory. We didn't know at the time what coronavirus meant to um, the transplant population. We knew that they would be more susceptible to it, how much we didn't know. Um, trying to balance that for uh, the risk of actually doing transplants in the presence of coronavirus compared to deciding not to do transplants because it might be too risky was something that we had no research to back us up with. We had, it just was the expert opinion of the, of the doctors in the hospital to decide where we felt the balance of risk were. And some units around the country felt that the risk was too much and, and stopped some programmes. Other units like ourselves kept going. And there were some parts of our programme that we felt um, maybe the risk uh, outweighed the benefits. So for instance, with the, the living donor kidney programme um, where uh, obviously there is somebody donating a kidney who is otherwise well to put them through a major operation in the in the midst of the coronavirus maybe not been the best thing so we stopped our living donor program as did um, every other kidney transplant unit in the country but we kept going with our cadaveric kidney transplant program the liver transplant programs nationally all kept going in every hospital because because obviously anybody who's on the, the waiting list for a liver transplant, um, if they are, were not to get a liver that became available that was suitable for them, then they may not um, survive to get the next liver. So we felt that it was imperative that we, we kept being able to accept every liver that was offered to us. In reality, the absolute numbers of transplants around the country reduced because the absolute number of donors reduced. And that was because of the pressures on intensive care units and the ability of, 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 of donation to proceed um, and the anxieties around could the donors um, potentially transmit virus so there was a huge amount of work done nationally by NHSBT to ensure as much as possible there was uh, good uh, and safe environments for donations to take place and that, that every potential donor was thoroughly checked to make sure that they were we're not carrying the virus. And as far as I'm aware, um, there's been no instance nationally of, of the virus being transmitted to a transplant patient. Um, that's not to say transplant patients haven't caught the virus, of course they have, and we know that their risks now, because of the data we've gathered, have uh, an increased risk of coming to harm from the virus. But actually within Cambridge, we have not seen it in, in a great extent and actually we've had a number of transplant patients that have had had the virus and, and, not, and not seen kind of uh, any 
uh, terrible outcomes, as it were, from, from the majority of patients. So that enabled us to, to have the, the, the confidence that we felt that we were doing the right thing to keep transplanting. But to actually do that required a lot of effort, both from, I said, from the logistical point of view, but also managing the patients on the ward, which I think uh, Stephen's going to talk about and, and in the clinics afterwards. But the actual act of the transplant itself became more challenging because we were having to operate in the personal protective equipment, which is much more constricting. It doesn't enable us to communicate in theatre as well. It slows activities down, both in getting patients to theatre, getting them anaesthetised ready for theatre and actually the operation itself. And that's where the, um, the liver perfusion machine, the Organox machine that Professor Watson has just described in the video to you, was, was fantastic because that enabled us to give the time when the liver was on the machine to be able to continue to manage the transplants in the way that we would have done before the coronavirus in the presence of the coronavirus, where everything, every step along the pathway took more time because of more checks being done, just the, the uh, having to wait for tests to make sure our patients weren't carrying the coronavirus, the, the, when they go into the anaesthetic room, the, the increased time it takes for the anaesthetist to anaesthetise them because they're having to wear all the protective equipment and similarly in surgery. So we, we felt that the, using the machine enabled us to continue transplanting livers and, um, and, and actually we saw the, the amount of livers that we put in the machine increase significantly during the coronavirus to, to enable that. Um, most, in fact, all transplant centres in the country have now restarted the programmes. Um, but throughout the whole of the coronavirus, since it started, since February, we've, I think it's fair to say, still been the most active centre in the country and certainly have, have done more kidney transplants than, than, than anybody else. And, and I think that our department should be very proud that, that since the 1st of February, when the coronavirus really hit, we've, we've actually, up until the 1st of November, done 144 kidney transplants, um, which um, is actually on par, if not even a bit more than what we would have expected to have done at this time last year. So it's taken a huge effort from everybody. I'm very proud of the team here, how kind of engaged and willing to help in, in difficult circumstances. And, and, and all the, uh, the staff were anxious themselves about carrying. But I think it's fair to say that seeing the, the, how people are in the ward, the, the biggest anxiety we had was for our patients and trying to keep our patients safe. And I think the ward staff did a fantastic job in that. But I think Stephen may want to speak a little bit more about that now. Thank you, um, Neil. Yeah, so absolutely. <clears throat> I think the biggest challenge that, that we had is um, with the midst of COVID going on, actually, we still transplanted. So we still had patients being assessed for transplantation. We still had patients calling in for transplants and still facilitating the transplants. With the back of all of that, we also had all of the patients um, that we had to care for all the way through. So people that were admitted for other reasons onto the transplant unit um, and people that were transplanted successfully and then discharged home and then had the outpatients follow up. Um, so in terms of a, a, a nursing perspective, um, myself and Kate, I think always at the back of the mind is um, how are we going to facilitate and keep all of the patients safe? Um, and this was on the back of um, a massive um, response to the surge of COVID within the trust and a massive shift of um, nursing manpower. So we had um, a large proportion of nursing teams, um, transplant nurses on the wards be moved off to critical care areas to support them, um, which left a deficit of nurses on the transplant units. Um, my coordinator team then um, uh, very, very quickly filled that de deficit um, and made sure that we were able to keep on transplanting um, and looking after the patients afterwards. You then have the issue about managing the risk of COVID within the transplant unit. Is there a, a potential outbreak um, and what could have happened? Now, I know Kate's going to touch on this um, in her talk in a minute, but it's just around about everything was changing rapidly. We had to have a rapid um, changing workforce and a rapid um, uh, change to outlook in what, how we're going to care for patients. We managed to cope really well with um, changing on the inpatient setting, changing the ward configuration, F and G5 around to cope with, is there any risk of COVID and how actually um, we can mitigate that risk as much as possible to A, keep transplanting, but also B, keep the patients that were on the ward and the staff um, as safe as possible. And I think, you know, um, I'm really, really proud, as Neil says, of how we managed that. The other issue we faced was, um, uh, as Neil says, 200 um, kidney transplant patients a week go through clinic. 
and um, there's about 50 to 60 liver transplant patients a week that we also see through clinic at the same time and small bowel recipients and pancreas patients as well all of these patients were facing shielding um, and being restricted about what they could do but they also needed to be seen appropriately and assessed appropriately to make sure that we were keeping them as healthy as possible um, and also keeping their transplants um, uh, as healthy um, and looked after as possible that was a huge huge effort from all of the team um, and we again had to think very carefully about how we delivered safe and effective care um, to make sure that patients were still reviewed um, what that resulted in is a, a massive increase in telephone phone consultations um, and working with the wider community, um, GP practices and other hospitals, um, just making sure that we could get the appropriate blood tests and the appropriate tests from our patients um, at the right time. Um, I'm pleased to say that all of those um, changes that we put in place um, through COVID is actually something that we're going to continue to do. Um, we've had good feedback from patients, the, 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 the transplant patient team um, um, body, that they, they are enjoying the fact that they don't have to come every single time. And we're back into a surge um, uh, process. So absolutely, um, it's something that I'm very proud that we've achieved and that we're able to continue to keep people safe. Thank you very much, Stephen. I thank you, Neil. I think it's been really interesting to hear about how, you know, the experience you've had throughout this year, how you've adapted so quickly to ensure that you can continue to provide the higher level of care for your patients in what are extreme circumstances. So it's, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, it's also really good from our perspective to hear about how the equipment and um, the support we've had through the charity has um, continued to support the department throughout this year. So, you know, the liver perfusion machine continues to be so helpful for the department, which is fantastic. Um, we do also know that charitable donations have enabled a huge number of projects and equipment um, to be purchased and environmental changes to take place. And this is all thanks to the generosity of the supporters of the department. So in the next section, we're going to hear from Neil again, but just about a couple of pieces of kit um, that have been purchased thanks to the generosity of a patient who is grateful for the care that the department has provided. So thank you very much to that person. But if I can hand over to you, Neil, to tell us a little bit about the theatre lamp and vein finder that you've been able to purchase and what the difference that will be. Thank you very much, Katie. So yes, technology um, and if with every walk of life is continuing to move forward and and uh, you know as as much as we try and kind of keep that going within medicine, there's the ancillary stuff that we need to help us. And and, and in theatres, um, one of the the one of the most important things for us when we're operating is the is the light that we have to see um, when we're in body cavities and and, and deep dark holes as they often are, um, and having a good kind of accurate functioning um, uh, theatre light is, is essential. Um, but there's so much more that can be done with a theatre light and that's what we're wanting to have with the, this new theatre light. And it, 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 it is um, the old days of training where we would have maybe one or two trainees in theatre that could get very close to, to a patient and scrub in with you and be able to see what you're doing when you're operating and learn your operating techniques, how you handle tissues and things like that. But the reality is with now with training, we have so many more doctors, nurses, anaesthetists training in theatre that they're in theatre hearing what can go on, but often can't see what is going on. Um, so our new theatre lamp that, that we're, we're purchasing is, is going to have a state-of-the-art inbuilt camera. So basically that it will see everything that the surgeon is seeing and the direction the surgeon is seeing and will be um, kind of able to be shown on a screen in theatre and potentially in other rooms in theatre so that trainees can see what we're doing all the time and be able to discuss through throughout the operations and and, and even especially in this current environment of, of the coronavirus when we're trying to limit people and the, the the social distance of people particularly as well in theaters then having the ability for for that to happen um, and see things remotely will be will be excellent um, and it will be not just things done live will be uh, we'll be able to record operations and they can be used for teaching and training of, of all types of nursing students medical students uh, and things it also um, will have a I think a, a significant patient safety um, input in that for the types of operations we we are undertaking the transplant theatre there is such a close interaction between the surgeons and the anaesthetists and it actually will be very useful for the anaesthetists to see what we are doing 
and see the, the, if it's a stage of the operation where everything's going well and they can manage the flares out, or if they see there's a stage of the operation where there may be a bit of bleeding and then being able to react to that before, before um, we're having to tell them that, that, that there's problems. Um, and so that is useful. And, and, and as much as we are able to see the anaesthetic machine and see how the, the anaesthetists are going, and, th and that close relationship will be made better, I think, with, with them being able to, to see that. So the, um, the theatre lamp, uh, the new theatre lamp, will be um, uh, very, very valued. And um, also from a situation for the surgeons themselves, we, we have to wear headlights just now for pretty much every operation we do because of the, the need for light. And, and the hope is that this new theatre lamp will reduce our requirement for wearing headlights itself, which will you know, long-term help with the health of the surgeons and, and their necks and backs as, as we all suffer from. Um, the, the other thing we're talking, which you mentioned, Katie, was that it was a vein finder. And one thing that the transplant, I mean, me having not been a transplant patient, I really can't say, but the transplant patients do have to have bloods taken every single day on the transplant unit and, and for long periods of time and multiple times in their admissions. So often their veins become damaged and it becomes quite difficult to find veins. Um, and we've got a specialist vein finder which both the nursing staff and the doctor staff can use to help find small veins under the skin where we can take blood and do blood tests from, which will help the patients very much, but also help the staff as well uh, in that. And, and, and I think that will be uh, a, a small but ex exceptionally useful piece of equipment on the ward. Lovely, thank you very much Neil. It's really good to hear that, you know, from big pieces of kit to actually the smaller pieces, the charitable donations we've had are just continuing to make a difference to both the patients and also the well-being of the uh, surgeons by the sound of it with, the, with their necks and backs. So having looked at the pieces of equipment that have been introduced as a result of charitable donations, we're now going to hear from Kate Pickley about how charitable donations have also been particularly beneficial for the patient environment in the wards. So Kate, can you tell us a little bit about the central monitoring and the um, doors that have been installed in the high dependency unit? Yeah, thanks Katie. Um, I'd like to start by saying a big thank you to the donations we've already received and it's already made such a big impact on F5 especially. Um, so back in 2018 um, we had some sliding doors installed on F5. So originally they were just open cubicles and curtains for dignity. So thanks to ACT they um, helped fund some sliding doors um, and now we can receive patients with different infections that before we couldn't do. Um, so before they'd stay in ITU a bit longer, not getting the specialist transplant care that we can provide for our patients. Um, it helped the organisation as well by doing patient flow. So, you know, staying in ITU less time with us a bit longer. Um, and then also because of COVID now, we have some sliding doors so infectious patients can stay in there. Um, and then, so with the cardiac monitor, um, we, we can now see all five patients on a central cardiac monitor at the nurse's station. Um, this is so beneficial because within literally the first week of it being installed, my nursing staff were able to see an abnormal ECG rhythm before the patient even had symptoms. Um, and it was just such a benefit. We saved lives that day and it's, it's happened since many times. Um, so the, the sliding doors installed, cardiac monitor installed, it's just it's just such a benefit really and I just want to say thank you so much. Um, if we can go to the slides for the next bit Katie. Yeah so uh, thank you very much for that Kate and I think it's brilliant to hear that the environmental improvements that are being made continue to have a huge impact on patient care you know every day in the wards. So as I briefly mentioned earlier there are some environmental improvements that are being made as we speak thanks to um, a really generous donation from a patient that we've had. So um, we've got some slides to share with you and Kate's going to talk a little bit about improvements that are happening on F and G5 literally as we speak over the next few weeks. So if we could share the slides and then Kate you can talk us a little bit through them. So on F and G5 we've got two day rooms. Um, they are the first port of call for all patients, the first impression we have. This is what G5 looks, looked like previously. Um, but thanks to a donor, we've now got funding to make them look a little bit better than that. <laughs> if you go to the next slide, please. That's still G5. As you can see, it's not very good, not good impression. And patients did complain about um, seating not being very comfortable. So we've listened to what 
their views have been. If you carry on, please. Next slide. Yep. So that's G5. Uh, as you can see, yeah. next slide, please. And this is F5. Um, these rooms are also used for the coordinators to do assessments in visitors. Um, Transplants when they got called in, they'd sit in here and wait um, until the bed was ready. And as you can see, it's not very inviting. So I asked ACT if they could help fund to have these redone. So, yeah, and the next one, please. Okay, so this is what they're going to look at. So this is the G5 day room. As you can see, there's going to be two very comfortable sofas. There's going to be a cabinet with a TV so that relatives and visitors can come off the ward and, and go sit in there. And we've got some lovely wall art on the walls and make it look a little bit less clinical, really, because some of our patients are here for up to a year. Um, and sometimes it's nice just to have something that doesn't look like you're in a hospital. If you go next slide, please. That's, this is the F5 day room. Um, this mock-up shows there's a TV in there, but actually we're gonna remove the TV and have it as like a, a quiet contemplation room really, somewhere for patients, relatives, and especially because of COVID, we're finding staff um, somewhere where they can sit and just, you know, have a little think about things. Uh, next slide. So that's what they're going to look like. And this is work in progress. So this was literally taken last week, that's G5. The wall art is already up and it's looking really nice. We've got loads of compliments already from staff, um, patients and some visitors. Uh, this is the F5 one. So it's a small room, but it's a big impact already. Um, we're literally just waiting for the furniture to be installed, which should be in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully everything should be completed by Christmas is the plan. And then that'll be great for all the patients, staff, visitors to sit in really and that was only, it can only be achieved because of ACT helping us in funding it. It just wouldn't have been done otherwise. It's been 10 years they've looked like that. <laughs> oh thank you Kate. I think it's just so exciting to be able to see the transformation as it's happening and I imagine we've got a number of people on this call that have probably sat in those rooms and actually experienced what it feels like to be in a room that is quite bland and probably the chairs aren't that yeah. comfortable so I think it's the first room they enter so yeah it's, so I think I think those changes are going to make a huge mm -hmm. huge difference and it's, yeah it's thanks for the generosity of the supporters so as you said thank you thank you to everyone so and thank you to you Kate that was really good insight into the difference that donations have made to the environment as well as you know, obviously the equipment that we can make fun better. So I'm going to move on now to the Q&A um, section of the webinar. So we have got some pre-submitted questions, but do um, if anyone has any questions and they're on the webinar now, please do just pop them into the Q&A box. So if we can start off with one pre-submitted question that we've had, and if I could direct this, I think, at Chris. So how do you think immunosuppression will evolve in the next two, five and ten years? Well, since I came to the unit, we've seen quite a dramatic change. We started off with uh, cyclosporin being introduced while I was a student, um, and we've moved on from cyclosporin to tacrolimus being the mainstay of our, of our treatment. Um, as companies produce new drugs, they have a patent on them, which gives them the right to market them for, for 10 years. And after that 10 year period, anyone can, can market that drug. So the prices tend to plummet at that stage. Um, so, so now the development costs of drugs aren't going to be borne out by anyone bringing a new drug to the market because they can't charge a premium price because all the other expression is so cheap. So I don't think we'll see anything developed in transplantation per se, like they have been, like cyclosporin was developed for transplant, like tacrolimus was developed for transplant. But I think we will benefit from drugs that are being developed for the treatment of other conditions where the immune system matters. So the autoimmune diseases like vasculitis, um, like uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, we're already seeing some of these drugs being used now for, for transplantation. Um, 
The other thing that I think will happen is that rather than giving people, uh, patients a, um, a target level of their immunosuppression, say a target level of tacrolimus based on what we think the population needs, I hope we'll be able to be more personalised and, and come up with some technology that will predict the amount of immunosuppression that a given person needs. Because not everyone needs the same amount. Um, if we treat someone with the regimen we use nowadays for kidneys, for example, 20% may get some rejection, 80% won't. So we're probably over immunosuppressing most of the 80% and under immunosuppressing 20%. And it'd be good to be able to, to personalise that to, to make that uh, um, more targeted. So that's how I, I would hope to see uh, immunosuppression change in the future. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and I think we've got another one that is best answered by you as well. So as an ageing and obese population, how um, do you continue to improve outcomes for marginal reactions? I thought you were addressing me as an ageing and obese surgeon for a minute. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, one, of the big, one of the big things that we're doing at the moment with the liver machine and, and uh, Professor Nicholson's work on the kidney machine is to try and be able to assess organs before we put them in. And, and um, we know a lot of information about what happens, what, what the donor's biochemistry is and the circumstance around their death, but we don't really know what happens to the organ while it's being stored, um, usually in the cold. The ability to not cool them down and the ability to test them when they're being preserved will allow us to be, to be um, able to predict how well a, a particular organ, be it a kidney or a liver or, or whatever, will, will work after we tra transplant it. And I think that'll be a big change to help us um, uh, appropriately transplant organs from older donors and, and uh, donors who are obese. Obese donors are, are a particular problem for, for the liver where the, the, the liver can become fatty. When we cool the liver down, those little fat cells in the liver turn solid and damage all the cells around it. Um, and then when we take it out of the ice and, and transplant it into someone, we expect it to work immediately, whereas actually we've caused damage by cooling it down. So it may be that actually moving our liver machine to the donor hospital so we don't have to cool the liver down would help us with those with the, the more uh, obese donors with the fatty uh, livers. The other thing the machines allow us to do is to treat the organ in the machine. So we may come up with some, some treatment regimes that are able, allow us to um, uh, target the, the particular problem with the, the organ and improve its function. Another thing that's happening at the moment, next year we'll see the largest study um, of treatment of an organ donor um, to, in the world, and that'll take place uh, starting next year, where we're going to give a drug to um, organ donors to see if we can improve the outcomes of all the, all the organs. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question we have, I think, Stephen, if you're able to answer this. So do you have any plans to support transplant patients who suffer with mental health problems due to the effect of waiting for a transplant and dealing with the enormity that is the transplant itself? It's an issue that is very real within the transplant community, but is often overlooked. Um, thank you. Um, I completely agree with the, the sentiment of the question. I think it's something that we, as a transplant coordinator team, as, um, especially we're very aware that um, the mental health side of things isn't always addressed. Um, I think the, the transplant coordinator team tries their best to help and support patients and guide them through as much as they can. Um, but it is something that we're aware of and we're looking into how we can address um, uh, that issue um, and be more, more inclusive and more holistic, I suppose, in our approach to, to patient care. Not just looking at the, the transplanted organ and um, the, the blood parameters, but actually taking more account of um, how the patients are feeling and um, making sure that they're looked after properly. Um, I think one of the, the biggest issues we're going to face um, with anything like this is actually funding and it's something that we're hoping to work with with Actin and actually trying to um, uh, find money to support um, an initiative to, to actually address this situation. So, yeah. Brilliant, thank you very much Stephen. Um, we have a question that has just come in actually on the chat and I don't know who would be best so please someone nominate themselves. Um, is there anything on the horizon such as new technology that the department think will bring another step change in transplantation? I, I could tackle uh, the start of that and, and uh, please Neil or, or anyone follow on. Um, we have a liver machine at the moment which is great for our liver transplant patients. We have a, a rather Heath Robinson kidney machine. Um, I'm looking at Neil here because the person sitting behind him has pioneered it but fortunately is not there at the moment. But it's a rather Heath Robinson device. Um, the same company that makes the liver machine have adapted the technology 
to produce a kidney machine. And that's supposed to be in trials at the end of this year, but COVID's delayed that. But hopefully we'll be able to do the same sort of thing for, for kidneys routinely. And that'll have a, a, big, a big bonus because often we, we're faced with two or three kidneys to put in in one evening. They do take a time to put in. You've only got one surgical team. Well, we have two surgical teams on at night, one for livers, one for kidneys, but we can't do everything at once. Um, and to be able to, to, to preserve the, the kidneys on a machine that restores the circulation to them so they don't deteriorate while they're cold will be a big advantage. And again, it allows us to test them. So that's one element of technology. Um, the other thing that, that's happening because of um, COVID is, is, as Stephen said, we're having more remote consultations. Um, there's a move to try and do, do finger pricks or thumb pricks and then do blood tests based on that. So sending your, your thumb prick on a bit of blotting paper to the laboratories and, and see if we can analyze the, the, and, and come up with a, um, uh, your crack new, for example. We know we can, we can interpret your tacrolimus level that way, but, but other important elements. So it may well be that technology will help us treat everyone remotely. Thank you. I think I, I'd just like, it's, 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 this is not a new technology, but I think I'm certainly hoping that we might see a step change in donor numbers. Um, obviously the, the new donation law um, came out in kind of April, May time, and, and it was understandably overshadowed by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and it, it will be a bit of time until we find out what effect that has. But I, I actually think that the, the coronavirus pandemic in itself may ultimately lead to increased donor numbers uh, for the reasons of, I think, and I hope that the NHS has been seen in a very good light during the coronavirus and how, you know, how dedicated um, the staff in the NHS are. And, and when good news stories come out of the NHS, that often uh, flows into increasing in donor rates. And the other thing that the coronavirus pandemic has required for pretty much every hospital across the country is to increase their critical care capacity for the critical care beds. And I suspect that that won't shrink back down to pre-COVID levels afterwards. And having uh, more advanced, bigger critical care units will help in the, the donation process also. So we may see uh, an increase in, in donor numbers. And I certainly would hope so with the, with the change in, in the law as well. And of, of course, that is the the prime driver for transplantation. We cannot do it without the, the families and the, and the patients that, that, that donate the organs. Um, that will give us potentially capacity issues about how much that, that we're able to achieve. And, and that's what we are working on here in, in Addenbrookes and trying to gain more theatre space. You know, the Addenbrookes is looking at um, in the next kind of phase, there's discussions about a, a new hospital or expanding hospital and certainly transplant will be at the forefront of trying to, the need for more space for our transplantation patients and both in clinics, ward, theatres, etc. So though it's not novel technology, I think there, 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 there may be a step change in the, in the number of donors that occur. Brilliant, well thank you both um, Chris and Neil. And then sort of on that note, I think there's one question that's come in saying what is your dream wish list for the transplant department so neil are you able to help yeah, us I, mean, with that? I think that, that could be an, an endless discussion um but i think it what what it essentially is encompasses is, is 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 to try and improve the entire patient pathway so that's from um when we actually start seeing people in outreach clinics so when they come for their transplant assessment uh, sometimes people have to come from quite long distances, spend long time. So trying to reduce the travel of patients, reduce the time that the assessments take. Then when they come in for their surgery, us having access to the top technology in theatres, the access to multiple theatres to be able to manage our transplant activity. We are trying to, in Addenbrooke's just now, um, uh, create another transplant theatre 24 hours a day to enable us to have two, two theatres open 24 hours a day for transplantation, as well as creating a, a specific and dedicated room for the machine perfusion and um, preparation of organs. And having all of that um, is certainly on my wish list to have from a point of view of, of things happening in surgery. And then of course, probably the most important part for the patient is what their experiences are like when they're in hospital. And what's already happened or happening in the day rooms is fantastic. And then trying to improve the patient's experience, but things that can make, patient experience on the ward more comfortable and the staff experience because we do work hard and the you know anything that can be done in and around the, the unit to improve staff well-being I think 
uh, we should be looking at also. Um, and then the, the introduction of the novel technologies in clinic to enable people not to have to maybe return as often to see us. We will still obviously want to see people face to face at regular intervals, but if, if more can be done remotely um, with that, then, then I think encompassing trying to improve the whole package would be on my wish list. It's not very direct, but, uh, but certainly, I mean, I, I guess one thing that we know, and as Chris alluded to before, is hopefully going to be in the horizon, is a, a machine for the kidneys like we've got for the livers. And that would, that would definitely, we would like to be at the forefront of driving that uh, like we have done with the liver machine. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, we actually have had a nice, this isn't a question, but it's just a really lovely uh, comment that someone would like to share with you all. So it's from Alan Craig and he submitted this to say, I'm delighted to be celebrating the 31st anniversary of my kidney transplant this year and wish to pass on my grateful thanks to the renal services team who carried this out in 1989 and to compliment everyone on the excellent follow-up care since then. So I think that's really lovely to hear that actually many years on we've got very very grateful people who you've cared for so that's really lovely to hear that. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple more moments to see if there's anyone else who has any questions um but what i might do is move on to our next section and then i'll come back if we've got any more questions for people to ask so we um have obviously spoken a lot today about the difference that charitable donations have made to the department the incredible work that you all do and actually the incredible work that you've done in this extraordinary year that we've had um but I do just want to say behind, you know, all the donations that we've been able to spend in the uh, department are the most extraordinary and passionate fundraisers and donors who have committed to supporting the department thanks to the care that you've all provided them. So we just want to show you um, all a video from one of our fundraisers who um, would like to talk about her motivation for supporting the department. So we've got Joyce Cripps, whose daughter Julie has been cared for. Uh, by the transplant department and she's Joyce is going to tell you a little bit about why she supports the unit so Jonathan if you wouldn't mind playing the video please. Hello I'm Joyce Cripps, mum to Julie Halls. Julie was critically ill in January 2018 and required an emergency liver transplant. Cards and letters were not enough to thank that wonderful transplant team for saving Julie's life which is why, as a family, we decided to fundraise and in two years have raised £9,000 by organising tribute nights, garden parties and tombolas together with generous cash donations from our friends. Unfortunately, due to Covid, three planned events have been cancelled. I will always fly the flag for Addenbrooke's because without that fantastic team, my story would have been very different. Well, that's just lovely. And, and I think, you know, it's a true um, inspiration that we've got lots of families like this that continue to want to uh, support the department, which is amazing. So I think I'm just going to wait for a couple more minutes to see if there's any more questions. But I would also like to thank um, our speakers today for, for giving us a really, really good insight into the department and exactly what you're, you're all doing on a day to day basis, but also obviously the difference that the support that you have makes. Um, to the work that you're able to do. So I think the message we'd like to say to everyone who is watching today is if you have been inspired by the department and by people like Joyce, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with Adam Brooks Charitable Trust. We simply cannot achieve all that we've been able to without the amazing support of our fundraisers and donors. So every donation that's been made, and I hope you can um, can see that from today's webinar, no matter what size the donation is, it's had a huge impact on the department and the care um, that they've provided and also the experience that patients are having um, while they're being cared for by this amazing team. So if you would like to be involved in supporting the department, whether it is to fundraise or donate or volunteer, or even just help us to spread the word in your local community, we'd be really delighted to speak with you. So at the end of this webinar, when we say bye, you will be directed to the ACT website and you can make a donation there or get our contact details because our fundraising teams would really, really love to hear from you. Um, so with that, I would like to, as I said, thank our speakers today. You've all been incredible. You're doing great work and it's just been a real honour to actually 
hear from you firsthand exactly what you're all doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure everyone will agree in saying that you've been absolutely fantastic and given us a real insight into the work you do. Um, I would also like to thank everyone who has attended the webinar today and listened to us. And finally, just to thank everyone who has donated or is even considering supporting the department. The difference that you make and your donations make is absolutely huge. So um, thank you all very much. And um, we hope you have a great day and hope to hear from you all soon.